Horror is our future, and you cannot be afraid. You must push everything to the absolute limit, or else life will be boring. People will be boring, but horror is like a serpent, always shedding its skin, always changing, and it will always come back. It can't be hidden away like the guilty secrets we try to keep in our subconscious. No. It's living and breathing. The two stories I have for you tonight embody this. Two from Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. Well, my dear friends, it is once again time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I live in a village in a small country in Eastern Europe. The area is very rural, mostly farms and houses. To the distance you can see a mountain range, and to the opposite side is the highway. Our area has never been developed. Every course of the government to fix the infrastructure goes to deaf ears. There aren't any street lights, and most of the houses are connected by gravel roads, which I suppose is an improvement to the dirt roads we used to have. I suppose... Partly the fact that the area is unheard of, and partly the fact that it's remote, and partly the fact that no one is armed, is what made the place enticing to thieves. I live with my family in a small house. There are five of us, my parents and my siblings. Everyone in the village knows each other, but I am only close to four of them. One night, while I was helping my family with farm work outside, it was getting dark, and I could hear shouting and yelling a little ways off. I wondered what the commotion was about. A little bit later, one of my close neighbours, John, was running and shouting, saying thieves had come and taken his livestock. So a group of us had gathered with whatever improvised weapons we could get and headed to John's property. All we could find was a broken fence and empty pens. After this incident, nothing happened for the next few days, and we hoped it wouldn't happen again. Oof, we were very wrong. I was about to go to sleep on one particular night when I heard sounds outside. I went outside to see what was happening and I could see, not too far off, on one of the neighbor's houses, there were four dark silhouettes. It appeared like they were carrying something. I went back outside and I went to wake my family. All of them were groggy and annoyed that I'd woken them told them to stop making noise, because the thieves had returned. They all got up, especially my dad, and went to find a shovel as we all huddled next to the window to see what was happening. Suddenly we saw a shadow pass by the window, and it sent a chill up my spine. It was one of the robbers, and he was armed. He was dressed in all black, including a balaclava to cover the face, and was carrying a rifle. We watched helplessly as he looked around, going from house to house. He stopped at one of the houses and motioned with his arm as several others dressed in the same manner and armed came to the spot. We saw them hauling several items, mostly garden decorations, and also a few chickens. When they left, we could see in the distance some lights turning off and heading towards the highway. After this incident... It just became a regular occurrence. Sometimes they would come every night. Sometimes they would come every few days. Well, we called the police. When they showed up, they'd stay a while, but then leave. They didn't know who was doing it, but they couldn't afford to stay there for long. We asked them desperately if they could leave patrols in the area every night. It would only be a matter of time before they broke into someone else's house. We called anyone we could... News agencies, investigative reporters, anyone in the media, just so we could get word of what was happening. Finally, someone came from one of the investigative journalism shows on TV to report on the area, and they interviewed the people and told us that they would go and ask the police department about the thefts. We thanked them, as we told them that they'd been the only ones to try and help us, and no one else was bothered. Some of us suspected that the local police themselves were involved. We didn't know what to do, but when we began to organize ourselves and were post sentries throughout the village, they had let us know if the thieves were there. We also began to fortify the houses with whatever we could, 
to keep the thieves at least from coming in. Things, though, went back to usual as the thieves kept coming back. This time we saw that they were trying to break into our next door neighbor's house. It belonged to Mark, one of our close neighbors. It's directly across from us. Oh, we were scared. They tried with whatever they could to break the door, but nothing was working. Mark had barricaded all his doors. Then one of them aimed at the door with his rifle and fired several rounds, and then continued to try to break in, but he wasn't budging. Oh, he put something really tough in place. And finally, they gave up. They looked around and saw our house. We prayed they wouldn't come, but they did. They did the same thing, trying to knock down our door. They didn't know it, but days earlier, me and my siblings had helped our dad brick up the doors, so if they tried to break the door, all that would be waiting for them would be a brick wall. They tried everything they could, but nothing was working. Frustrated, the thieves fired several rounds into several houses and then left. The next day, all the people gathered in the village. We knew things were going to get even worse at this point, and it was time to make a decision. We could stay and try and hold them off, or leave. Some of us didn't even wait around, we just gathered their belongings and left. My father had decided that we would stay. We pleaded with him to leave. Someone might get killed, but he insisted on staying. There was nowhere that we could go anyway. We ended up being among the few people that had decided to stay. Hearing that we had, our close neighbours asked us if they could come and join us. Mark, Peter, David and John, along with their families. We agreed, and at least we would all feel safer together. When night fell, we all got quiet as we listened for anything. Tonight it seemed like the world had gone mute. All we could hear was one of the wind chimes from John's house moving with the wind, making things that much more eerie. We waited and waited, but nothing. I wanted to stay up, but sleep was getting the better of me. I was awoken by the most blood-curdling scream I'd ever heard. After that, we heard several shots. We went to see what was happening, but... All we could see was the black truck that the thieves usually came in, speeding towards the highway. We waited for an hour, and finally agreed to go see what had happened, but only five of us, John, Mark, Peter, David and my dad, went out, armed with shovels and steel pipes. We waited for them to come back. Finally, when they did, they said they couldn't find anything. All they could find was blood on one of the pens. My dad told everyone there to stay until the morning, and after that it would be safe to leave. No one disagreed. When morning came, all of our neighbours went to inspect their houses. Some of them had been broken into and looted. I asked my dad where he'd seen the blood, and he showed me the spot. It was in the pens where the neighbours keep the animals. It didn't make sense. Why would they shoot the animals? We wondered who'd scream like that. It was the most unnatural scream I'd ever heard. For the next few days, we'd all huddle up in our house, including our neighbours, and waited out until morning. Nothing seemed to happen. After the third day, one of the neighbours that had left came into the village and asked us what was going on. He was so scared that the thieves would come into his house that he'd left with his family without even locking his door. In fact, his door was ajar. We went to inspect his house with him. It was exactly how he'd left it. Nothing had been touched at all. We became worried. What had scared off the thieves so that they'd stopped coming? Well, after this, word started to get around that the thieves had gone for good, and many of our other neighbours began to return. Things slowly began to get back to normal. One night, before I was about to go to sleep, I looked out the window for a while. I looked at John's house across from us, and for a split second, I could see what looked like a shadow, and it scared me. Had the thieves returned again? 
I told my dad what I'd seen, and all of a sudden everyone gathered by the window to look out. My dad went to get his shovel, as he told us to stay inside and lock the door. He ran to John's house and knocked, and John came outside. They talked shortly, and he went back inside and got a coat along with a shovel. My dad ran back to the house as we opened it, and he said we would go out with the neighbours to see if the thieves had returned. That night my dad and some of our neighbours, including John, went out to see if the thieves were around. After an hour or two, the men came back, but the sight of them walking through the streets and near the other houses had alarmed the other neighbours, so they all came out to see as well, and they asked the men if the robbers had returned. Well, they could only reply that someone had seen something, and they were seeing if something really was there. Finally, my dad came back. It had been a false alarm, but none of us slept very well that night. After that night, things really did seem to go back to normal, but I wondered for how long. In order to calm my nerves, I usually like to head towards a small park, not too far away from here, by bike using the highway. We were told by the police not to do it, and they'd even threatened to take our bikes, but we didn't care. The highway was our only link to the outside world, so we took it to get where we needed to go. Now, on this particular day, I rode my bicycle to a park about an hour away in another town using the highway. In this town there was a park with a small lake that I would go to to relax. I stayed there for a few hours, bathing in the sun and watching the water sparkle. After a while I decided to head back home. As usual, I took the highway back careful to avoid cars, and passed through our rough gravel road as usual. It had become dark now, so I got off the bike and walked to our shed. We had quite a large shed where we stored various farm tools. When I entered, I put the bike inside, and then I heard a sound. It wasn't the first time I'd heard a sound in there. I mean, we'd found a rat inside once. I looked around. The shed had two rooms, so I looked at the other room and saw what seemed like a face peeking through the doorway inside. I was frozen in fear. I was trying to make sense of what I was looking at. Was it a person? I looked, but there's no way it could have been human. And then it moved out of the doorway and I could see more of its body. It was completely black and hairless. It looked almost like a human, but it wasn't. Its face was absolutely disturbing. It had a white outline that made its face appear like a mask, and it had what looked like two short horn-like crests on its head that were white and rounded with a pointy tip. Immediately, as it stepped out of the doorway, something inside me told me to look away and stay still. I immediately looked away. The second part of the instructions were quite pointless, as I was frozen stiff. The thing approached me. It moved in an unnatural spider-like motion. I could see in my peripheral vision it was looking at me. It had disproportionately long, thin limbs. I could see its hands had long fingers and long claws. It reminded me a lot of the rape creature. It stayed there, looking at me. It moved to the side where I was facing, so it could look me in the face. But I looked away again. As I looked away, I noticed what looked like a smile on its face. Oh, it was a super creepy smile. I could even see its sharp teeth. My guess is, well, it wasn't smiling. It was just showing its teeth something I'd learned in various nature documentaries, a sign of aggression in animals. I could still see it from my peripheral vision as it closed its mouth and walked around me in that awful, hideous, all-fours movement. I was even more scared now because I couldn't see what it was doing at all. I could hear that voice in my head again. No matter what happens, don't move a muscle. That's when I heard the most god-awful scream ever. But I remained still, 
though trembling uncontrollably as it got in front of me, but this time it was on two legs, and its mouth was open. It was about my height, and looking me in the face. I looked away again, but I was shaking badly, as I used every inch of my being to try not to move. It kept constantly moving to look at my face, but I looked away every time. A sudden sound of metal dropping on the floor made it look behind me, and then it moved in lightning-fast motion. I didn't know if I should look around, but all of a sudden I felt a hand on my shoulder. Why are you waiting here in the dark? asked my dad. I was so relieved as I turned around and hugged him. By then I turned into a blubbering mass of jelly, and I was shaking uncontrollably. I was tearing up. My nose was running. I think I may even have peed myself. Dad was confused. He asked what was wrong. I didn't say a word, but I didn't sleep at all that night. I eventually fell asleep in the morning and woke up later in the day. I remembered that face and that smile, if you can call it a smile. I knew now why the thieves had run away. I stayed there thinking about what had happened and it made sense now why the thieves had not returned. This thing was a nightmare. That day I asked my dad if he could get me some sleeping pills when he headed into town. He asked why, and I just said I couldn't sleep. He said that I don't need them, but I pleaded with him, and finally he agreed. That night I took two of them, and after a few minutes I was out. I woke up the next day with a horrible grogginess and a weird taste in my mouth. I got up slowly to get a glass of water. And then I remembered that creature again, and I felt a cold sweat on me as my hand shook. What was it? Was it a rake? The only thing I could think to call it was a black rake. Oh, this horrible thing had an identity in my mind. The Blake. I figure the more I know about it, the less power it would have over me. I looked around and noticed no one was inside. I called out to everyone, but no one was home. After a little bit, I went outside. I could see a way off. There was a crowd of people. They seemed very upset. I went close to see what had happened. I could see what looked like the police chief on the ground, bloody, and his clothes ripped as he was being abused by the crowd there. I asked one of the older neighbours, Mark, what had happened. He said that the thieves had come back again last night, and asked if I'd heard it. I told him I was asleep. Oh, I don't know how you could sleep with all that commotion last night, he replied. What exactly happened, I asked. He said that the thieves had returned again last night, but then they started hearing some horrendous screams and gunshots. When the shot stopped, people got out of their homes to see what had happened, and they saw this hideous creature attacking one of the thieves. The men managed to scare the creature away, but when they took the man's mask off, it had been a police officer. Even worse, his friends left him to die while they all ran away, said Mark. The people in the village contacted the investigative journalist again, and he came right away. This story was not one he was going to miss. As to the creature that had attacked the thieves, it was passed off as a bear. But people in our village knew exactly what it was. One of the farmers, Peter, had even remembered days before the thieves arrived that many of his animals were going missing without explanation, and he thought that maybe it was a fox or a jackal. My dad even remembered the night when he'd found me in the shed shaking, and now I realize why. Ever since then, my perspective on this creature has changed. I don't think this creature is evil, but then again, neither is a tiger, but that hasn't stopped them from killing people. It only acted defensively, and I think it was only gauging if I was a real threat at the shed. Now it seems to me that our prayers were answered in getting rid of the thieves. Help did arrive only from the most unlikely of sources.
people always complain about millennials like we're the bane of this world. But let me reassure you, me being in my mid-twenties, I'm financially well off and responsible thanks to my efforts. I can run the household and deal with problems like an adult. Yeah, sure, my temper gets the better of me, but I've never tried to beat anyone senseless, unprovoked, let alone shoot up a school. The generation that came after us is definitely more unhinged, and not in an angsty, teen rebellious kind of way. No, the younger kids are really messed up lately. You can blame all the politics and the video game violence in the world, but that's all bullcrap if you ask me. Teach your kids not to be actual monsters. Tell them video games and action movies are a good way to let out that anger. Don't let them bottle it up, because, because when they do, when we do bottle up, everything goes wrong. Mad wrong. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling here. So, a few days ago, I was walking my dog and it was getting kind of dark, so I took a turn home. Now, there's this little grass patch about 150 yards away from my flat. As I was passing through this little patch of grass, I noticed someone all curled up in a fetal position on it, all twisting and twitching with their back to me. My dog, well, she didn't seem to be alarmed by the sight, but I was kind of baffled. So I approached the person, and when I was at arm's length, I noticed there was a massive red spot on the person's white hoodie. The sight of red worried me, and being a decent person, I crouched down and tapped the person on the back. Hey, you all right? I asked as my heartbeat rose steadily while my dog was rolling in the grass as if nothing had happened. A teenage lad turned to face me. By all that is sacred in this world, that face, that freaking face made me jump three feet backward. I didn't expect this. I thought he might be wounded or something, but I was sure his torso was messed up. Instead, I was greeted by a chap who had about two-thirds of his face torn off. His facial muscles were gleefully hanging on his skull for the whole world to see. Holy shit, I screamed out as the kid turned to me. Yep, yeah, all's good, the kid responded with a shaking tone in his voice. Yeah, your face, I mumbled due to my sheer surprise. My dog ran towards him and began licking his face. Don't, don't, I called out to her. Hey, it's just makeup, man. Don't worry, the kid reassured me, still visibly shaking. A wave of relief washed over me. Had this been the real deal, I doubt this kid could have maintained his consciousness. I can't even imagine just how awful it feels to have one's face peeled off like that. Is she adopted or... The kid asked me. Yeah, she is. Got her from a shelter, I responded, thinking it was odd that he'd asked me that question at a moment like this. That's good. People don't seem to realize just how many animals are looking for a warm home, you know, the kid remarked. Yeah, I responded, trying my best to hide my discomfort with him. The kid, he seemed way off to me, but not odd enough to alarm my dog. Usually she barks at people who are the wrong type of... Or, well, just wrong in the head. Don't know if she's a psychopath detector or something. But Jess knows who the real bad guys are. And she knows when she doesn't like them. Anyway, with the kid still shaking, as if he'd been through a tornado and now visibly trying to catch his breath, I asked him again. You sure you're all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm good, man. Thanks. Just excited, he responded faking a smile in his obviously worried face. What, about some Halloween party or something? I joked. No, he said as he looked around, as if trying to detect something or someone. I don't think I should talk about it, man, he continued. I leaned in close. I've got friends in dark places. If you need help with something, I could help you, buddy. I was lying. I just wanted to know what this kid had gotten himself into. Clearly something wasn't quite right with him. Well, I do have a buddy that works in the local PD, so who is that? Oh, I don't... He stuttered. Listen, pal, I live there. 
I pointed at my place. And I'm alone at the moment, so, you know, if you need any help of any kind, I can try to help you. I extended my arm towards him, and he took it. Uh, right, I guess, he muttered as I pulled him up back to his feet. Man, could you take that makeup thing off? Oh, it's disturbing, I remarked as we made our way to my place. It was clear as day that this kid couldn't do anything to me. He was too shaky to walk straight, and his grip was outright pathetic. Armed with that, I took him home. Initially, there was no intention of doing anything to him, just wanted to make sure he could get home safely. Well, he tore off his prosthetic skin with a pained yelp as we stood at my doorway and tossed it in the trash bin. Well, seemed like a decent kid. I was curious to find out what had happened to him. And with that, I sat him down in my kitchen and made him some coffee. He wouldn't stop shaking, and his voice wouldn't stop quivering. Sure, something was really wrong with the kid. He kept on assuring me that everything was fine. Are you sure you're all right? Yeah. Want me to call your parents or something? There was somewhat of a pause when I said that. His gaze. It went kind of blurry, and his eyes welled up a little. No, don't. The last thing I need is him around. Him? I asked. My sperm donor. Freaking hate him. Tough father. I pressed on. No, father, I wish. He's just an asshole who likes to beat up those who are weaker than him. God, I hate him. Let's, let's not talk about him. He retorted with some sting in his still quivering tone. Oh, I responded with pity. So, so what happened to you, if you're finally okay with letting me know? I pressed the issue. Oh, I gave the assholes at school what they deserve. I could almost hear the pride in his voice. A knot formed in my stomach as I began noticing the genuine smile forming on his face. What do you mean? I asked, slowly feeling myself lose my cool. Well, you see, all these bastards, they thought they had power because they have a bit more cash than me. They thought they could pick on me and abuse me and my friends. They made my friend attempt suicide. And I showed them just how weak they are in response, he said, with an almost menacing grin on his face. What? Did you beat them all up? I inquired as I sat down across from him. No, I'm not my father. I taught them a real lesson, the kid said, pulling out a bloodied knife from his pocket and placing it on my table. Damn, I said. I didn't like where this was going, but I had to make sure the kid would stay put until I could get a hold of my friend in the PD. Suddenly, this kid seemed like he could shoot up his school. I needed to make sure he didn't get off the hook. Yeah, with this, but also with his gun, the kid continued. His gun, I asked. Sperm donors. It was useless, just like him. Got a few of those fuckers, and then it ran out of bullets, he said before further declaring. He threw in a few good punches, and then get gassed out, and everything that came after the first ones wouldn't even hurt that much. Sometimes I wish I could just repay him the failure, but I can't bring myself to. I can't do it, no matter how many opportunities I've had. I just can't hurt the guy. That made me feel uncomfortable. The kid had something wrong with him. At least, he tried to convey that. I noticed that he kind of cringed a bit at his own statement there. You did mention your mum before. Why doesn't she... He cut me off right there. She doesn't know, or care. Or I don't even know, man. She's a junkie. She's hooked on that shit. I don't want to talk about it. His real personality finally shone through. He seemed like a hurt little kid who'd gone a little too far. I looked at him, and I was sure he was about to cry on me right then and there. Feigning the need to go piss, I grabbed my phone and headed towards the bathroom. Before I went, I told him I'd like him to tell me more about the kind of stuff he'd done to those assholes from his school. Oh, it kind of 
would regret that now, but I had to make sure that he didn't lose his shit on me. Weakling or not, the kid had one hell of a knife. So I went to the bathroom, called my cop buddy and told him to be at my place with the team, just in case, you know. I went back to the kitchen, and I asked him to tell me everything he'd done. Turns out he went quite ballistic on whoever these kids were. Completely mad. If he hadn't been so shaken up by what he'd done, I would have thought he was completely off the rails, but... Turns out he was on a shit ton of painkillers when he started bashing the living hell out of his schoolmates. So, there is that. Gotta say, he has a decent internal build. He must have taken a dose you could give a horse without passing out or dying. Anyway... By the time the cops arrived, he'd revealed to me, wholeheartedly, that he went to a party organized by one girl from his class, shot six people, by sheer luck managed to turn the electricity off, and stabbed a few of the guys who beat him up on the regular, apparently. Oh, he mangled those poor kids. I'd spare you the details, but, but oof, I'm pretty sure he knows what a human gallbladder looks like now, judging from his description. He took particular pride in telling me about how he managed to press one of the kids' heads against his crotch while stabbing the back of his head repeatedly until brain matter was flying around. Well, something gives me the feeling that they'd mocked his manhood. Anyway, he sounded almost psychotic by the time he reached the climax of his story. So, I grabbed Marissa Horvat, the girl who organized the whole thing, by the arm, and threw her down the stairs. She rolled down the stairs like a mannequin. I always thought she looked like one after the seventh grade. Yeah, too much makeup. Ah, if she was with me, I'd make sure she was wearing the right amount. He was rambling about this girl with a certain stickiness in his tone. Shame such a pretty body contains such a shitty personality. Oh, it doesn't matter now, though. I have the best version of her in my memory. He continued. I dragged her by the hair to the bathroom and shoved her face down the toilet, telling her what a bad girl she is. It's like he was getting excited thinking about waterboarding this girl. She wouldn't stop resisting, so I had to bash her face in against the toilet seat. God, I felt sick. And then against the wall. I swear I wanted to stop, but I couldn't. I felt too good to do that to this bitch. He was snarling at this point, completely lost in some sort of twisted bliss. I was holding back not to smash his face in. And then I just kicked the pulp that was her head until my knee started hurting. I was probably as red as a tomato with anger at this point, but I couldn't let that show. I'm glad he didn't notice, and I'm glad that I'd held myself back from tearing his head off for what he said next. Do you think I should have, you know, because I just bailed it out of there after I was done with her. Well, I fell in heaven after she stopped moving, man. So I bailed it out of there. I was sure I was done. I was shaking with happiness, man. His voice trailed into the realm of zero confidence again. I didn't care that much, though. This kid, he wasn't some victim. He was just a brat who'd overstepped every boundary out there. I... I was interrupted, luckily, by the flashing red and blue lights and the sirens of a police car making its way towards my yard. Shit! He screamed and scrambled for his knife. I stood at the other side of the table, smirking at him, knowing all too well that he'd be caught now, no matter what happened. You... You, you're one of them. You're just like them. You, I hate you. His voice squeaked as he charged toward me with the knife. Before he could do anything, however, he slipped on his own shoelaces and fell face first onto the floor. The knife nearly flew into my face. I narrowly dodged it and stood there for a few seconds, alternating my gaze between the knife, now stuck in my wall, and the kid laying on the floor. A surge of anger flowed through me suddenly, and I marched towards the kid. I was going to kick the living shit out of him, but stopped myself from doing that when I heard him sobbing. 
That's when the cops came knocking at my door. I told them to come in. Turns out the kid broke his nose in the fall. They took him into custody. I'm sure you'll hear about him in a few days on the news. This little pest is a mass murderer. Jeez. What does this world come to? I mean, my dog didn't even bother biting the guy, even after his knife nearly killed me. Well, a lovely couple of stories to keep you entertained on this beautiful Friday evening. Now, a lot of you have been asking about the Where Wars Are Assholes series. Well, good news. I've kind of finished recording the next part. Couldn't quite get it edited in time for today. It was going to be my video for this evening. But it will be with you on Sunday. So if you are a fan of that series, stay tuned for Sunday evening. Because it's a big one. It's going to be about an hour and a half long. And it's a humdinger. It really add, brings a, quite a few different storylines together. So um, if you haven't listened to all the ones before... um. I will be posting a link to the uh, playlist that I've put together. Make sure you don't miss it. Well, that's enough for me for one evening. But like I said, I'll be back again on Sunday, and I hope you'll join me. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music, and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>